Well, that's interesting to me because I hear that Mary Blair was kind of embattled at the studio because her, her graphic style was, it, it defied Disneyfication. It was hard to animate it. But Walt, I mean, the, as I understand it, Walt always pushed Mary on the animators and yeah. on the designers and said, give me a three minute sequence based on this. And they oh, would yeah, say, you, yeah, I can't, you yeah. can't animate that. Yeah, well, you know, the, in, in truth, that really wasn't a problem because what Mary came up with was a was an overall design sense uh, of design style and color and then the animators had to take that and then pull that into the Disney style so it really wasn't a conflict uh -huh. not that much and and while it's true some animators might have grumbled about what Mary was doing was and she had pushed it a bit too far. The thing is, going too far is not a problem because you can always pull it back. But but what she gave you was something that you might not have thought about had she not pushed it that far. So in that sense, she was great for the studio. Walt recognized how great she was. I think Walt knew that what Mary was doing was often pushed much further, you know, than he would want to go. But that could always be pulled back. But the essence of what Mary had put down on paper was always there. And of course, the Disney pictures were all the better for it. I always like this. Oh, yeah. Where, where the moon is actually darker than the ship. I and know. the ship is illuminating the, the water rather than, you know, I don't know. Exactly. Now, and now, how many people would have thought of that? I mean, how many people would have had I, that way of thinking about color? And she uh -huh. did that kind of thing consistently, you know. She was, it was. She would always do something where everybody would say, "Oh my gosh, I never, never considered that. I never thought that we could have the moon darker than the ship. They, uh -huh. The moon would always be the the brightest element right. in the scene. But Mary's just superb use of color just made everybody look that much better. Now, what about some of her figures, though? I mean, look at these Alice's with their, you know, that's yeah. that's not the illusion of life, obviously. No, no, that's and, a... and, it, and it doesn't matter because what she's giving you is the essence of Alice, you know, that's Alice. Okay. Now, now, of course, a guy like Milt Call is going mm -hmm. to take that and bring it back into that Disney image we all know and recognize. But what Mary has done in her brief color sketches, she gets the essence of the character mm -hmm. and the color and how it all works together. And I think that was her, her, her brilliance. And once again, this ties back into uh, Tom Hanks a couple of weeks ago when we were shooting on the lot. People were saying, well, you know, Tom Hanks doesn't look exactly the way Walt Disney. Yeah, but I said, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I think what Tom is capturing is the essence of Walt Disney. He he gets what the man was like inside. The outside, yeah, he's got the hair combed back and mm -hmm. he's got the mustache mm -hmm. and he's wearing the suit. Kinda, sorta looks like Walt, but not really. But I said, when you see this scene play on the screen, you're gonna forget it's Tom Hanks. Uh -huh. you're, go you're going to see Walt Disney. And I think that's what Tom is doing. And I think that's all we need. So, you know, so with Mary, it's the same thing. She gets it. It's uh -huh. all it's all here. Now, the finished result is not going to be that, but all of that informs what everybody does as it moves through the production process. Mm -hmm. You know, her styling will inform layout. Her designs will inform animation and her amazing color palette will inform the background artist. So in many ways, she's done so much of the work for you, you know, by starting with Mary, it makes the rest of the job easy. She, she's that, that point of inspiration that makes everybody who follows that much better, you know. Everybody is lifted right. to a new level uh -huh. by, by Mary's work, right. by, by her concept. It was just so far ahead of what anybody else could have done. She's basically taken everybody and moved them up uh -huh. to another level. And I think that, and I recognize that even as a child, you know. And, and for me, it was like, you know, I'm a kid in junior high school saying, my God, who is this woman, you know? <laughs> who is she? she? She is just, she's beyond good. She's not only good, she's just amazing, you know? There are few people like that. And Walt Disney recognized how good she was. And that's why she was almost like, that's why he gave her carte blanche. He's like, uh -huh. Mary, here's a project that uh -huh. we're developing take it and do whatever you want. You just let her go. And, and I think that's what's important about talent. You don't try to manage talent. And I think Walt Disney was smart enough not to manage talent, but mm -hmm. to take that talent 
and, and, and let it go because you'll never, you'll never do better you know, than just allowing the artist to do what he or she does best. And, and that's a lesson to a lot of managers today, mm -hmm. what I call them, a lot of boneheaded managers. Mm -hmm. I said, you, you get good people and you try to tell them what to do. They already know what to right. do. You don't know anything. Recognize that you don't know anything and let them do their thing. Let them go. And the few times I was in charge when I had my own company some years ago, I would hire, you know, and, and I think, here's what management skill is all about. When I was a manager, and I was only a manager briefly, but I would hire good people and leave them alone. Let them do their job mm -hmm. and they will only make you look good. You, you mm -hmm. can't lose. No, they'll make you look great, you know, if you leave them alone, if you don't try to micromanage them or, or give your stupid opinion, because your, your opinion will be stupid, I guarantee it. <laughs> Uh, a genius uh, that I worked for uh, some years ago named Steve Jobs because I worked in Pixar briefly when Steve was still there before mm -hmm. Steve went back to Apple and one of, one of the things I was so amazed that Steve Jobs who was known as a micromanager famous for interfering with everybody when Steve Jobs was at Pixar a company he owned by the way owned the whole thing he left people alone he could have interfered, he could have gone to story meetings, he could have sure. gotten involved because after all, it was his company. He was smart enough to say, I own this company, these guys work for me, they're the best in the business. If I'm smart, I'll just leave them alone and let them do great, great work, then I'll take credit for it. Right. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and that's what Steve would do. He, he would leave his, his team alone. And then Steve's picture would be on the cover of Time magazine. Uh -huh. <laughs> Steve Jobs does it again. <laughs> Pixar's latest hit. You know, that's a smart manager. Some other artists whom Walt gave that kind of carte blanche to. Not, not that many. I would say probably John Hinch, uh, Ivan Earl, and that's why it's a short list. I, you know, going back to the, I keep, I keep in mind I got here late. The whole '40s I missed. Mm -hmm. I, I missed the whole era of the '40s. And so, forty eight guys like Tyrus Wong, and you know, the, for the work he did on Bambi, you know, and so, so, but that was that was before my time. But but uh, there's probably a lot of other names, guys who did brilliant work long before I got here. I mean, when I was still a toddler, you know, and all this yeah. great, great work. When Walt gave one artist that much creative control, did that ever create any conflicts or any resentment? Among oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, human nature. Artists can be competitive. And so when Walt, say, gives one artist carte blanche, hey, just go do your thing, the other artist will grumble, well, yeah, you never, you never told me that. You never thought I could go out and you know, paint what I want. You know. Grumble, grumble, grumble. When, when Walt Disney once in an interview mentioned that Ward Kimball was a genius, Oh Lord, oh. went on for years, the grumble like, oh, Walt, Walt never called me a genius, you've been working here for 20 years, you know, you never said I was even any good, you know, so. So it, we often joke that the artists were kind of like children, you know, you know, fussing over, you know, one child being, being patted on the head by yeah. dad and, and being the favorite son or the favorite daughter. So yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of people got bent out of shape by, by Mary and by others. And to a degree, it might even explain a later period in Mary's life when things weren't going that well for her, uh, when she was, after Walt's passing, when she got some pretty shabby treatment here at Disney. And I think a lot of that were a lot of jealous people looking at this as payback, like, oh yeah, well she doesn't have Walt to protect her now, I mean, she's, maybe she's not as big as important as she thinks she is kind of thing. So, uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see human nature play a part in that because Mary did get some pretty shabby treatment, uh, ill-deserved treatment, you know, after Walt had passed on. What happened after that? What ha what kind of shabby? I mean, I know that they, she just finished up her Imagineering projects that she had gotten when Walt was alive and they yeah. never gave her any more assignments. Yeah, well, it, yeah, toward the end of her career, she had a difficult time finding work. Yeah, she had a difficult and And there's no reason why anybody as, as talented as Mary Blair should have a tough time finding finding a job, but it's amazing. And I, and she's not the only one. I've seen it happen to other people where they will just slam the door on you for who knows any number of reasons where they think that you've been the favorite child for too long. They are envious of your talent. 
you know, they know that you're probably better than they are. Uh, people can behave uh, shabbily, you know. And, what, what kind of shabby treatment did she get besides simply not getting any more work? I don't know, because a, a lot of that I, I didn't learn until, you know, and, and I, I was just a kid myself, and so oh. I didn't even know a lot of this stuff was going on. And not until years later I, uh -huh. I heard about it from others or read about it, but, <clears throat> but I, I do know that she went through a very tough time uh, late in her career, at a time when she should have been just um, treated so much better. And, and for someone who had a such an amazing career at Disney, such a distinguished career at Disney, to be treated uh, as poorly as she was, uh, to me it was just inexcusable. It was just really inexcusable. And I know that it happened because uh, Walt wasn't around to, to uh, you know, it happens when, when uh, management's change. It, it goes on today, so it's nothing, it's right. nothing all that surprising. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I do know that, and you're probably well aware of her problem with drinking, and, and that didn't help things any. Right, uh, right. Walt would sometimes look the other way when, when, when people, had, people had problems with, with alcohol abuse. Uh, Walt was very supportive of Freddie Moore, who was uh, who had a real problem with, with alcohol and always made sure that, that Freddie, you know, stayed on the payroll or mm -hmm. had a job or had something to do he didn't, he didn't want, you know. Because, because of all of the contributions. I mean, mm -hmm. Walt could be, you know, really loyal to people that he felt had given a great deal of themselves to the studio. And, he, and when they fell on hard times, he was always, uh, you know, very supportive. I, had, I, I don't know all this stuff for a fact, but I had heard stories back when I was a kid here that Walt even kept people on the payroll who had long since, um, you know, outlived their their uh, usefulness here at the studio. But Walt kept them on the payroll out of out of a loyalty that this person, you know, helped me out when they were, you know, when they were contributing. Now uh -huh. they were older. They uh -huh. were who knows, maybe old age, just burnout, maybe maybe booze or whatever it was. Uh -huh. They were no longer productive, but they were always given a job because Walt felt that he owed them a job for, for what they had contributed. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you really had to mess up big time in order to get fired. If you had had a fair number of years for the studio and, and had contributed, uh, there was kind of almost an obligation the studio had, had to you to make sure that at least you would have a job. I did hear about her drinking, and Mary aside, have you ever known anyone, and you don't, don't have to name any names, yeah. but known anyone who, who really destroyed their talent with drug use, who destroyed their career, their talent with the... Uh, oh, yeah. Drug, oh, really? Yeah, many, many. Uh, it seems that in, in my parents' generation, uh, because most of the artists, when I came here, were the age of my parents, I often joked about, I felt like I was this kid often working with friends of my mom and dad because they were all older. Uh, uh -huh. When I was working on Jungle Book, I was in my 20s, and a lot of the men I was working with were in their 50s and 60s. So you feel like I'm in, I'm in the room with all of these adults, and I'm a kid. You know, why am I here? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I should be seated at the children's table. You know, so, but, but because during that time, uh, it seems that, you know, we talk about drug abuse today. Well, the, the, the drug of choice back then it was always cigarettes and booze, uh -huh. and it was just a, um, it was considered a normal thing, and it was not unusual to open your your uh, your animation desk drawer, bottom uh -huh. the bottom drawer, uh -huh. and and hear something rattle in the back and reach in and find a bottle of scotch. This this happened to me, you know, a number of times, you know, where I might move into an, a new office and, uh -huh. and, and get a new desk and 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 you know, hey, what's that sound uh -huh. back there? And you reach in and there's a. Is an empty, an, em an empty fifth of scotch or Jack Daniels or uh -huh. whatever. It's because that's what adults did back in the 40s and 50s. They were, you know, today, that's like almost unheard of. I can't even get an animator to, to have a glass of wine with yeah. me. But boy, boy, this was the day of the five martini lunch. Like the TV show Mad Men, uh -huh. show, it shows these advertising guys back in New York. And, knocking back martinis. Well, they were doing the same thing here at Disney wow. in, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. I would go to lunch, sometimes with an animator, and the guy, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, did he have, is that number five? Oh, jeez. Is that five? I had, oh. I had one, and I'm, I'm, I can barely <laughs> stay in my chair. You know, I can, oh. am I gonna fall out of the chair? Oh. And this guy's on martini number five. Then uh -huh. they would go back to the studio and go back to work. 
God, what a capacity for, for alcohol. <laughs> but, but they were, boy, you know, the old guys and, the, and, and not just the guys, the women, they all drank. Yeah, yeah. You know, the old joke about they could literally drink you under the table. And, and there were some women who could do that. You go to lunch with them and, and you'd be on the floor and they, would, they would still be going. My goodness. But that was another time, yep. another time. And, yeah. and again, like I said, it was my parents. It was my parents' uh, era, and, mm -hmm. and every home had a bar. My parents had a bar in, in, in our home. Before dinner, you know, mm -hmm. hey, what are you drinking? Not the kids, of course, uh. but if they had friends over, it's always a drink before dinner. Mm -hmm. That's what you did. What are you drinking? And, and I remember uh, even uh, the, the writer, um, Carl Falberg, telling me that he was... Uh, He'd come up and, and Walt was happy about uh, some film was about to open and they, were, and they were in a jolly mood. And Walt Disney said said to him, hey Carl, what are you drinking? It's like a, like a normal, this was on the job, this was uh -huh. here at work, what are you drinking? Uh -huh. The bar is open, uh -huh. we're gonna pour a few. Long term, would that affect people's abilities? Uh, I think, and, and I'm not a drinker, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much restricted to a glass of wine uh, with dinner. And that's not every night. It's got to have some effect if, if you're if you're consuming that much. Because keep in mind, as I said, this wasn't this wasn't the, the guys who would go out and have a, a scotch with dinner or a glass of wine at lunch. This was this was serious drinking. I, I call it serious drinking right? because I, I couldn't believe the, wow. the capacity. So this had to have some physical effect on them because well, that much booze over a lifetime, it's just got to have some effect. <laughs> Although with some, I think it, it caused them to live longer. I don't know. It maybe killed every German. <laughs> so nothing could kill.